Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I got, I've been trapped into a whole bunch of climate change talks over the past three years. Uh, in part, uh, I gave a talk like this and uh, somehow word got back to the King of Sweden. And the King of Sweden invited me to go uh, have an all expense paid week in Greenland. And after that uh, all expense paid week in Greenland, eating, you know, eating phenomenal food uh, and talking about nothing but climate change, the king uh, sent us out with a, a final closing statement where he said that because of his position as royalty, and we all refer to him as your majesty, uh, he couldn't really promote or talk about the ideas that we discussed at this colloquium. But we were under no such stricture and he expected us to go do that. And so I've been having a lot of fun with climate change. And um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you through the past 2,000 years, more or less, of the interaction between human populations and climate change here in the Southwest which is the best record in the entire world for those two variables. And it provides a completely apolitical context for dealing with what we're facing as the issues of today. And I'm gonna run through 2,000 years faster than I've ever run through it before just to get it out of the way because the more interesting thing is then to just deal with the issues that it raises. You can ask as many questions as you want. And the first thing is that archeology span has been a science ever since Sputnik went up. And the funding stream meant that if you weren't defined as a science, you weren't gonna get funded. And so archeology span became a science right at that point. But the real reason we're a science is only because the stories I tell are intended to be criticized. We can't prove anything about the past. We can argue about it. We can propose circumstantial arguments that say this is what happened, and, but we can't prove it. We don't have a time machine. We can't go back. We can't test things. It's all a matter of interpretation. So I can assure you that I believe everything I say today but one of you young people in the audience can say, that, that sounds a little crazy. And then you can go out and disprove me and I'll go, oh, you know, you're right. <laughs> so it's a, it's a knowledge base that is constantly developing and constantly getting better. Everybody's familiar with today's climate change debate and to make this uh, nonpartisan, we can say, how many of you know someone who is an absolutely rabid believer that human-caused CO2 is affecting our modern climate? Yeah. How many of you know somebody who is a climate change denier and who thinks everybody is crazy? Good. Well, in this modern debate, we've got the questions of, is, is the global climate actually warming? People disagree about that. Is it warming due to carbon dioxide? They disagree about that. Is it because of us? Do we have the technological or behavioral ability to change whatever it is we're doing? What are the costs of action? What are the costs of inaction? And what should we be considering as we debate our decisions in terms of economics, politics, and even morality? That's the tenor of the modern argument. Uh, for me, I think we're compl completely missing the point. Climate change is going to happen. Humans have adapted to changing environmental conditions economically and socially throughout our history. This is nothing new. And our pattern is that we fill our niche, we exploit our environment, and when something changes, we collapse and we fall apart. And then we completely reorganize. 
And that's really what we're going to try to get at. One of the neatest graphics that I got from uh, one of the other guys' PowerPoints in Greenland is this one. This is the Greenland ice cores where we have uh, a 400,000 year record of different temperature proxies. But all of them are pointing to deep ice ages, very rapid rises in temperature to interglacials, and then descent again into glacial time periods. And what's important about this is the oft-stated idea that what we're looking at in the past 400,000 years is more time spent in ice ages than is spent into the conditions that we live in today. And when you look at that record of temperature from the Greenland ice cores, you see that all of our modern history is in this completely anomalous protect protracted warm period. Every other glacial period has ended with a sharp temperature rise and then an almost instantaneous reversal, except the one that we're enjoying right now. So there's something very different about our situation. The evolution of human beings as a species has taken place over these fluctuating glacial and interglacial time periods, uh, most of the time cooler than we have today. All of the modern cultural history that we hold dear and we teach in classrooms today really has, been happen has happened in this weird warm period that we're in. And <clears throat> warm periods always end, <laughs> at least in the past several hundred thousand years, in ice ages. So we've seen a whole lot of variety. In the small picture points, when you think of the history of modern humans, all of the uh, dark ages, the whack, you know, development of agriculture, the development of state civilization, all of that has happened within a time period of what in a geologic sense is microclimate variation. Nothing big has happened, but lots of small things have happened that have caused these incredibly dramatic changes in our history. Well, the Southwest, as I said, is probably the best place in the world to be an archaeologist, especially if you're interested in the dynamics of uh, climate change and human population. Uh, this is the Grand Canyon over here. This is us somewhere over here. I can't read very well right there. Santa Fe, Four Corners right there. This is this incredibly uh, beautiful landscape that encompasses high mountains and alpine vegetation, uh, deserts uh, where if you weren't in the spring, everything is brown and it looks like there's not a damn thing to eat anywhere. And then river valleys that go through it all. The most important part of the climate of this region is really the monsoon rainfall system. The systems that bring in moist air from the Gulf of Mexico and from the Pacific Ocean and bring them into the southwest, giving us this strong rainfall peak in uh, our July, August, September months. In the winter, we get our Pacific storms coming in. And it's interesting that Above this line, we're getting this pattern of strong winter, a drought, strong summer, drought, moving back into winter. That winter end summer uh, precipitation pattern is up here. Down here, we're in a summer dominant pattern where usually, and this year is one of those exceptions, usually we don't get that much winter precipitation. And what we're doing is we're setting up for variation in climate systems that turns out to be uh, sensitive or even fragile. Now, in this whole, you know, climate can change all over the place, but if it doesn't affect economy, it, we don't care. Well, maize is, or corn, is the basis of the ancient economy. And it is so carefully tied to the monsoon rainfall system 
that it germinates with soil moisture, but if it doesn't get those summer rains, you aren't going to bring a crop in. So you have to have soil moisture, you have to have s predictable summer rains, and if you do, you have a successful economy. And this is just the genetic transition from pre-maize grasses all the way over to maize as we have it today. The thing that makes archaeology so easy in this part of the world is their tree rings. Because everything is semi-arid, all of these trees are reacting to good years and bad years with putting on great big rings or little tiny rings, depending upon how much moisture is available to them. So the trees are a record of climate variation on a year-to-year -year basis. And the tree ring scientists, especially down at the University of Arizona, have been able to calibrate the recent tree growth patterns with our recent rainfall records, crop yield records, all kinds of things. So that you're going to see a lot of uh, graphs like this, where these are smooth departures from the mean, where this is a very droughty year, and they have recalibrated this into inches of precipitation. They've also done this as bushels of corn, often hectare of land, beans, all kinds of things. So we have lots to play with. But it's all based on tree ring records, where you see that we have bad times here and spiky little good times through here. So th you can get used to looking at those, uh, those patterns. Now, we've done so much archaeology, and this is pretty much that same frame on the map. So we have so many different treeing records across space that we can say that during this decade, 880 to 890 AD, Zuni was experiencing a drought, while Taos had plenty of moisture. So climate is not uniform over this geography. And it gets even more complicated when you let statisticians play with these data. And this is the results of a principal components analysis where it turns out that there are two general climate patterns for the past 2,000 years in the Southwest. A normal pattern, oops, like this, and then when that normal pattern just sort of completely falls apart and the tree growth patterns look chaotic like this. This normal pattern is similar to what we see in winter precipitation in the modern climate. And so we're looking at a, a climate of the past that is pretty structurally similar to the climate we have today. Where most tree rings give us drought information, if we go up to the alpine trees, they are actually responding not to drought, but to growing season length. So if we go to the high elevation trees, we can get a temperature record to contrast with our moisture record. Unfortunately, we've only got two of these cold records uh, from the southwest, one up near Pikes Peak in Colorado and one over at the San Francisco Peaks near Flagstaff in Arizona. But it's enough to play with and have some fun with. And we can play off the concepts of cold and the concepts of precipitation in this big semi-arid landscape. The dirty little secret of tree rings is that the statisticians massage that variability to the point where you really can't detect climate trends that are longer than 50 to 100 years because you've lost that dimension of variability. But we can get at it by pulling pollen cores from lakes, looking at the pollen that is within the sediment cores, and then watching how vegetation changes. So we have yet another measure to play off against the tree ring record. Uh, and that can get us to those long-term changes. 
And what gets me into trouble personally is I also think farmers are a pretty good measure of climate. If you can grow corn there, they lived there. If you couldn't grow corn there, they left and went someplace else. And so we can look at archaeological sites and follow them through time. And one of the obvious ones is the contrast that the early Europeans found when they came into the Four Corners area, where they encountered the cliff dwellings up at Mesa Verde and the Native Americans who were living there weren't growing corn, they were raising sheep. So we've got an initial contrast between the past and the present. And then you'll see this graph come up a couple of times. Uh, this is Farmington, New Mexico, right down here. This is, up here is Hesperus, Colorado, actually up here. And if you've ever driven this road, you're driving up slope. You're going from about 5,200 feet up to 6,500 feet. You're going from a farming area that is so dry now that it's really only good for dry, you know, rainfall irrigated farming under cooler and wetter conditions. Where if it's warmer and drier and you're a farmer, you want to be up here in Colorado. And we can look at the archaeological sites around, along the river and put them into dated time periods. And we can watch how people move and resettle in the up and the down uh, stream portions of the river valley. This is you know, the time period of human occupation in the southwest. Uh, we just had a talk uh, Monday night talking about pushing this back to 20 to 30,000 years ago. But we're only really concerned about the time period after corn comes in, which is 4,000 years ago. And our best archaeological record is really only in the last 2,000 years. And what happens is that farmers came into the Southwest, probably from Mesoamerica, now, corn came in first, but the farmers who were committed to agriculture came in quickly as sort of a demographic wave, and they pushed aside the hunters and the gatherers who were occupying the landscape, living off bunnies and bambies and grass seeds and pinyon nuts. They pushed them aside, and they occupied the Four Corners area because it was a good place to grow corn. And they came in at a time period when the climate, in terms of moisture, was really pretty pleasant. And they flourished. They didn't have pottery. They had lots of baskets. We have tremendous rock art. It, people, the population density was increasing like crazy. But, and you'll hear this far too often from me, all good things come to an end. And all of a sudden, they're hit with a protracted drought, a little before 300 AD. At the same time, the cold records show that it's extremely cold, so they can't go up slope to get more moisture because it's too cold. They don't have a growing season up there. And what they do is their, their entire adaptation their entire farming communities in this part of the world collapse. We have massacres, we have violence, we have social dysfunction followed by the complete abandonment of this area and the re-probable settlement of refugees down in the southern part. So climate truncated a cultural development that was several centuries in length. Well, climate changes. This is that droughty period. The rains come back. It gets warmer, so you can farm at the higher elevations again. 
And what we have is a, a new invasion of people from the south. By now they have pottery. If I keep my finger out of the way of it. They have pottery. They're in settled pit house villages. They're even more committed to corn agriculture than they were before. And they fill the landscape with homesteads. They're successful. Their families grow. The communities bud off. So we're, we are really in the midst of a population boom in a very, very successful economic adaptation. Except that climate is not static. When we look at our pine pollen record, spruce pollen, and we look at our cold season record, what we see is a slow drying of the climate between 700 and 900 years ago. It's getting drier, it's getting warmer, and pinyon pine pollen is an index of how strong the monsoons are, because pinyon pine loves monsoon rainfall. So the monsoons were strengthening. As a result, we have successful agriculture at high elevations. And all of those first colonists who were spread out thinly on the landscape, all of a sudden they all moved to Colorado. When they move upslope, we see that happening in Utah, we see that happening in Colorado, we see that happening up the Jemez River Valley. It's a pan-southwestern phenomenon. The climate allowed people to move upslope, taking agriculture with them. And the only things that went wrong were that they continued to grow their population. Things got crowded at those higher elevations. People packed tightly into villages. But they didn't have periodic droughts to worry about. So again, they were successful in that way. But there was a decrease in standard of living. And this graph here is a graph of animal bones per cooking jar sherd. And this is a reflection of how much protein is in the diet. And as these villages become denser and more crowded, they're having to rely more and more on corn, and they get less meat in every pot. And what we see in the physical anthropological record when we look at the skeletal materials is we see increases in dietary deficiencies. We see a population that is large and growing, but is weak and susceptible to disease. And then in 1886, the drought hits. In the 890s, there's an onset of cold and all of those high elevation villages collapse. They collapse with social violence, massacres, the occasional cannibalism, and everything falls apart. Things stabilize shortly after 900. This is that cold period that prevents any high elevation farming. The climate gets cooler. The monsoons still are strong in this time period. That opens up for low elevations for farming, and all of the people up here in Colorado relocate downslope. They spread out over a much larger land area, and they reestablish a successful farming economy. And this is the farming economy that fuels Chaco. They're producing surpluses of food. Everybody is sort of fat and happy. And that if, how many of you have been to Chaco? If you haven't, you've got to put it on one of your, you know, high school weekend trip things. 
You go out there and the first thing you do is you grab a camping spot because there's no place to stay out there except in the campground. And after you've got a camping spot, then you go hike through the backcountry and look at this incredible stuff. And basically, this is just like the New Mexico's economy today. In good times, there's lots of surplus, and you go into a big capital construction spree. And then the economy goes into recession, and there's no money for capital outlay. Well, if you look at Pueblo Benito, the focal point ruin in Chaco Canyon, you can see the pattern of building episodes. And those building episodes were funded by good times, when there was an unusually large amount of rainfall, an unusually effective harvest of corn. And so we have these spurts of capital investment. Everybody is having a great time with the centralized religious system. There are spin-offs. It's so successful that they export the religious system to outlying communities. So Aztec ruin gets built up near Farmington. And then the wheels fall off. The region goes into the most protracted and deepest uh, drought that we've ever experienced in the Southwest. The monsoon rain reliability falls off. The surpluses go away. And we have migration and movement out of the central area, out of the lower elevations, up to areas in the river valleys where you can still farm by access to river water, or higher elevations where you're still getting enough rainfall just because you're high. But without that centralized religious system here, all of these populations start to go their own way. So we see stylistic balkanization. Now, do you all know what balkanization means? The Balkans are all these little tiny European communities or countries. And if you turn them loose, they develop all of these inter-ethnic rivalries, and they break apart. You know, Yugoslavia used to be a single country, and now what? It's Serbia and Croatia and I think three other countries. And that's balkanization. There's all kinds of religious experimentation. There's local abandonments and migrations. But this isn't just a drought. Because when we look at these broader patterns, what we find out is this is a complete breakdown in regional climate. It's accompanied by a very, very deep and profound transition to colder climates. And the monsoon rainfalls that used to be adequate within this red band that rainfall is now all falling south of the red. So the monsoon rains have withdrawn from the Four Corners area, and all of those farmers are left high and dry. And if you go visit the Mesa Verde region, you can see settlements like this with a perimeter defensive wall all around it, enclosing their spring so they have a protected water source. And we see that everyone who lived in this village that was crowded along this sort of fin of rock was killed. More than 400 people were killed in a raid on this village. And the excavations have only been going on for about a year here, but they're finding exactly the same thing. These communities were suffering so badly economically that they turned on each other socially, trying to survive as individuals and as families. And the greatest irony to me as an archaeologist is that our cliff dwellings at Mesa Verde, the things that the entire public knows and says, oh, these are so neat, these cliff dwellings 
are the defensive last desperate acts of a collapsing social system. They're beautifully preserved, they're easy to look at, but they are a, a monument to basically the catastrophe that destroyed this ancient Puebloan organization. That climate change was so deep and so long and so pervasive that if you wanted to remain a farmer, you had to leave. And it wasn't just leaving your local area. You had to go a long way. So that we can track villagers from here who end up down in the San Pedro Valley of southern Arizona. And everybody is affected to some extent, but just south of us in Galisteo Basin, we have the formation of huge Pueblos. If you've driven from here to Stanley or from here to Klein's Corners, you've driven through ranch land. You can't dry farm corn there today. And yet we've got eight of these huge 800 to 2,000 room Pueblos, all funded by corn, all funded by rainfall that is completely unlike anything we have today. During that chaotic time period, during that withdrawal of the monsoon rainfalls to the south, we were the beneficiaries. In fact, the beneficiaries went all the way down to Chihuahua, the Casas Grandes culture. If you ever go down to visit Paquime, that was funded by the same climatic anomaly that produced the Galiseo Basin Pueblos. But nothing stays the same. So sometime around 1520, the climate returned to the pre-migration status. The monsoon rain system went back up to the north this normal pattern was reestablished. And all of those people who had moved down into these areas suddenly were left high and dry. Meanwhile, we have Apachean peoples who had cut loose from their communities up in Canada and had been migrating for generations southward they had filtered in around the Pueblo world during the time period when you couldn't grow corn up here. And so they were occupying the four corners as hunting and gathering Apachean peoples when the rains came back. And the bands that were living between Dulce and uh, Bloomfield started to grow corn, they started to adapt uh, and adopt uh, Pueblo religious systems that went with corn, and they transformed themselves into the Navajo. The Dinata is, here is the homeland of Navajo culture. Meanwhile, at about the same time, we have an incredibly deep drought, and we have a crash in the Pueblo populations, just at the time that the Spanish come in. If the Spanish had tried to colonize this part of the world 100 years earlier, they could never have overcome the Pueblo people. But they came in on the heels of climatic-induced economic failure. They came in to a weakened people and were able to push right in. The Spanish thrived in the good times in the very early part of the 17th century. But then in the mid-17th century, it goes back toward drought and crop failure. 
And that is one of the economic stimuli for the Pueblo Revolt. So if we look at these past 2,000 years, the real optimistic thing is Pueblo people are still here today. They've lived through all of this. They've kept themselves intact genetically and culturally. Climate stability for more than 200 years is incredibly rare. We should enjoy it when we have it. But we shouldn't expect it to continue. Oops. Too many buttons. In every single one of these sort of boom and bust cycles, when people set their cultural expectations at the height of the boom, they didn't want to give them up. And so they persisted in maladaptive behaviors, hoping that things were going to go back to normal. Until finally, it was too late. They would try all kinds of extra effort and innovation. They would plant more fields. They would plant fields in more locations. They would develop check dam series. They would try different irrigation techniques to try to bring crops in. And it would work for a little bit, but it could not overcome the major changes in climate. The first thing we see is that populations started to go down. More infant mortality. People had poorer health and were more subject to disease. And then people started to beat on each other. Because your choice was to try to ensure your survival and that of your family and your community or not. And so it really did set community against community. And there's a marvelous example of how social conflict makes climate change worse. And that's out at Pecos. Pecos was a farming community in the 18th century. And the Comanches were raiding. And the farmers would try to go out and farm their fields. And the Comanches would pick them off one or two or three at a time. So the farmers couldn't bring in a crop. It was too uncertain. And so finally, the entire community just collapsed on itself. Not so much because of climate, but because social conflict and that social contract we have with ourselves, which say that we're going to stop at a stop sign. You know, that's a simple social contract. If too many people start to break that, all of a sudden, the whole system fails. But that happens and messes with everything. Lessons for the present, I don't really worry that much about whether CO2 is causing climate change or not. What I worry about is that we're going to push ourselves into a crisis with whatever change inevitably happens because we have a population and resource imbalance. One of the remarkable tools that we have in this room, especially you younger people, is that you have the ability to sense history in a way that you have the potential to engage in preventive adaptation. Where in the past, you had to have reactive adaptation. When we see in our newspapers and magazines and on TV a debate between science and politics today, you can almost always look at that debate and recast it into a discussion of denial and a reluctance to change our expectations. Our half measures Maintain the status quo, but they're not going to prevent the inevitable. And applied technology and conservation is absolutely important, especially in the short term. 
But if there really is going to be changes in climate, technology isn't going to do it for us. In fact, we're probably going to have to move. And we're going to resort to the same migration solutions that we had in the past. The basic underlying lesson is that population increase is absolutely unsustainable. It's absolutely inevitable because that's actually our buffer against catastrophe. If we build our population up big enough, we can slough off a whole bunch. We can drop from whatever billion we are today to half that. And we've still got plenty of people. But you don't want to be one of that half that disappears. And what we need in our economy today are our alternatives to the concept of a healthy economy being a, an economy that is growing. We need economic models that don't require growth to be a measure of health. And we don't have those. In fact, if you look at what the entirety of the governmental response to our current recession has been, it's to try to make things grow because that's the only way we know how. But it's going to take something bigger than that if we want to make ourselves robust in the face of changing circumstances. What we need is a much stronger sense of the concept of human ecology. That sustainability is actually an extremely valuable commodity. And that we can buffer ourselves conceivably so that we can react more appropriately to changes in our conditions. We have to balance our population against our resources and our technologies. But most importantly, we're going to have to balance all of that against our expectations. And the expectations are the hardest thing to change. And we see that in the past, and we see that in the present. The most optimistic part of my whole presentation is you go back and Pueblo people are still alive today despite the European efforts at genocide, both cultural and physical. And in some senses, they're thriving. Although they're quick to point out that they're unhappy that the Navajo Nation is the only Native American tribe that has more population and more land area today than they had at European contact. A little bit of rivalry in there. But anyway, so that's my challenge to you. So, questions and comments? Yeah? Where is the possibility of um, some kind of uh, viruses or, or uh, um, flus taking um, the lives of the uh, indigenous peoples uh, just before the Spanish show? That's always a possibility. That's always out there. There's, uh, you know, just like the smallpox epidemics that were documented by the time there were enough Europeans around to record those things, that those epidemics um, undoubtedly came north, but we don't have a single shred of evidence of it archaeologically or in the physical anthropological study of the skeletal populations. What we have is a collapse in terms of numbers of people that begins before that, which correlates with climate. So I would, I would expect that disease contributes to it, but the collapse of the economy was more important. And one of the evidences of that, you know, in uh, Santa Fe was the focal point, really, of the Pueblo Revolt. But there were Pueblo communities all to the south of us. Galisteo was, is, is a classic example. By the time the Spanish reconquered Santa Fe, 12 years later, 
all of those settlements had been abandoned to the south. And the oral tradition is that when the Spanish were kicked out, the part of the justification was religious. We need to get rid of all of this European stuff that's cluttered up our religious system. So they got rid of wheat. They got rid of rye. They tried to go back to grow, growing corn again. They got rid of all of those pesky animals they were expected to herd. They ate them. But when they did that, the climate had changed so much that they couldn't go back to corn agriculture in the Galisteo Basin. So by the time the Spanish came back, everyone was here in Santa Fe or up in the Tewa Basin. They had basically redefined their economy in a way that they couldn't make it, the way the mission communities were making it just a few, you know, a generation before. Yeah. Yeah. Is that true all around the world? I think we're more I think we're more sensitive to it just because of the semi-arid sort of threshold that we're at. However, if archaeologists had the same tools elsewhere that we have here, I think you would see the same level of fluctuation in Mesoamerican societies. The same rise and fall of dynasties, if you will, based on the fluctuations in the underlying climate-determined economies. So, no, I, th I think this is a pretty accurate characterization of how long we can expect stability to last. And remembering that right now our stability is fueled by diesel. You know, if the tomato crop fails in Florida, we pick it up from California. <laughs> and, and farmers, whoever they are, they go wherever the stuff to grow. So I, I can see where maybe other things will take the place of agriculture as being destabilized. But do you think that that that's still an important lesson for us? Oh, I, th I think so. In fact. Um, I've noticed this year, more often than not, there are things that I want to purchase in the grocery store that aren't there. And the absence may only be a couple of days, and then they're back. But, you know, I don't want to create an ap apocalyptic vision. You know, our society isn't going to fall apart. We're not going to become, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to make incremental decisions on a year-to-year -year basis on how to redefine our lifestyle. You know, we've got a tremendously thriving organic uh, farming and farmer's market scenario. What has that done? That's raised the price of food. But it has made it possible for farmers to grow more locally. And so we may find in, you may find, the, the kids in the audience may find that compared to me, you will pay a much higher proportion of your income for food and a lower proportion of your income for housing than we have today. You know, we went through a period of sort of materialistic excess fueled by extremely efficient farming. And that may weaken a little bit and will redistribute where you spend your paycheck as a compensation for this. There may be fewer trinkets, you know, uh, and more, you know, as you get better quality food. Questions? Yeah. Uh, people or 
maybe young people in the future to really look at, at their own um, being able to grow their own food and, and being able to, because our dependence on diesel uh, can't go on forever at, in, uh, in, at, at, in the sense that we're using it in this day and age. Although we had a great presentation on biodiesel a couple of weeks uh, last month. Um, but I think uh, uh, my question is, uh, how do you feel about that? The sustainability, the uh, farming, the, the going back to the land? Well, I, I love the taste of tomatoes that are homegrown, although that we don't have warm enough nights to really make that work as well as you might in Las Cruces or someplace else. Um, my, I'm not sh we have too many people on the landscape to revert to farming other than for the treats. You know, we have too many people in an area where you can't grow enough food. So we're always going to be transshipping food over great distances. I do think that uh, you know if if I'm you know can influence any of the students out here. I think economics is a, just a wonderful field because it's going to be challenged. And the other thing is that where I see lacking in the newspapers and in the uh, media today is an appreciation of the complexity of causal arguments that in, people are trying to say, OK, this leads to this, cause and effect. And they're not looking at all the other variables that are actually influencing the situation. You know, human economic systems and social systems really need to be looked at in, in an ecological frame, where you look at all the different variables that are impinging on our decisions, religion, ethnicity, economy. You know, is the economy based on primary productivity here in Santa Fe? No. I mean, I'd love to see what proportion of the income in Santa Fe is actually derived from some other place and some other time. And how that artificially inflates our sense of well-being, even while kids have a hard time getting jobs. You know, there's, it's, there's marvelous complexities in there. Yeah? Do you see a trend for more people moving to urban settings so it's going to accentuate it? Yeah, but that may be a good thing. Because I'm wasting a tremendous amount of energy commuting to work every day. When if I lived in town, I wouldn't be doing that. Is that pretty local food? Not necessarily. I mean, that, that's why there, there isn't any sort of prejudgment in what values are best. You know, I had a marvelous, uh, you, you couldn't find a more conservative group of people than the Torrance County Archaeological Society. They're ranchers. And I bet they did not vote for our current president. But if I were to give a climate change talk to them in normal terms, it would be no communication whatsoever. But if the conversation is revisited in terms of what values do they want to see their children enjoy, all of a sudden there's fantastic commonality between everybody. So we have to remove the labels and think in terms of, really, what do you want the next generation to be able to experience? You know, and there's an in interesting thing on immigration. Uh, when immigrants come in from Latin America with high birth rates, you have a generation or so where high birth rates are maintained. But as soon as they get caught up in the social and economic systems here, the birth rates start to trend down. Those things, you know, the birth rates are a driving force of our economies. And it's something that, um, that isn't hardwired, and it's something that's extremely complex in terms of individuals' decisions about what they want to do with their lives, about the standard of living they want to convey to their children. And that often will result in lower birth rates. 
At the same time, it results in horrible emotional trauma when if you have an only child, that child dies in a traffic accident because you invested all of your hopes and your dreams for the future in that one person and an accident can take them out. Where if you had a family of eight or ten and if mortality was the same place it was three generations ago, you would expect a death in your family of one or more of your children. And it wouldn't be that big an emotional blow as it is to us today. So there's, again, marvelous complexities in all of this. Yeah? One of the complexities I think that I heard on the radio this morning was about the possibility of the climate change into a colder climate. That's the most intriguing thing to me because I haven't really heard an explanation for why we have had 8,000 years of warm weather because that's unprecedented in the past half million years. And when we switch back into an ice age, if the past is the key to understanding the future, that switch into an ice age can be extremely rapid can happen over, within the lifespan of a single individual. And if you think migration was interesting in the Southwest, what happens when you shut down Northern Europe? So, it, all kinds of fun stuff. I, well, I hope so. <laughs> the, the most important point for the young folks is really that there's a tremendous possibility out there and nobody can predict which way it's going to go. The most important thing for you is to have as many tools as possible so you can adapt in whichever way it goes. Even if you make changes in short term that turns out not to be effective in the long term, as long as you are nimble, you can bounce between and you'll do just fine. Any questions from the younger generation? Okay. You definitely should take the time to visit Chaco. Definitely should take the time to visit, visit Mesa Verde if you haven't. But when you look at it, don't just look at it as a pretty ruins in a park. Think of it as living people trying to make a life and succeeding. Like at Chaco, I mean, that's, an, that's like building cathedrals in Europe. But then it ended. So there's glory to be celebrated at the same time that there are lessons to be learned from all of this.